Andy Austin here with the next video in the series on better marketing for coaches. Although this video is not going to be so much about marketing, it's more about ethic or more importantly, work ethic. Now, I'm aware that the, I think, I might, might be completely wrong here, the majority of coaches and therapists and practitioners become so because they look to avoid the pain of work. Those who are looking for a career path will typically go into a orthodox profession. So they may become, might become a mental health nurse, they might become a, a go and do a counselling degree, go and train as a psychologist and do the post-registration, etc, etc. That's a lot of work that people have to do, a lot of work people have to put in to get to a position where they're then suitably qualified and able to start seeing people. Now, coach the whole coaching world, practitioner world, is built around don't do that. Who wants to go to university? Who wants to have to work for a living? Do a coaching course. You in seven days, you can have a practitioner certificate and we'll accredit you and affiliate you and all these different things. And you can start seeing clients immediately. And you're going to get a 10 figure, six figure, 20 figure paying client who are just hungry for your knowledge. And they will be willing to pay tens of thousands of pounds for your coaching. Really? news to me, I suspect most of the people who've got that disposable income won't need to go and see a coach. And if they did want that kind of input, wouldn't it be cheaper to go and train as a coach in the first place? So a lot of a lot of courses and certifications, not qualifications, but certifications are sold as a qualification, but also as an alternative career path. I'm aware of a number of NLP trainers, not just NLPs actually, a number of various alphabet therapy trainers who are essentially offering their courses as an alternative to a degree. And the fees they charge are pretty much up there with what people would expect to pay say in a year's worth of course fees and accommodation and all the rest of it if they went to university and people are willing to pay that much money if they are going to get an alternative career without having to do a three-year four-year five-year study at university including post-registration experience and so forth when you can just turn up sit in somebody's living room or on a skype call and essentially called yourself you've got a new career a new identity this is a problem so it tends i think it tends to attract a certain genre of person who is seeking to avoid the pain of work now the problem with that is now so many generations in to the whole coaching industry really sort of post 70s where more and more people have seen a how can i make a change in my life i know i'll help other people change theirs by becoming a coach a counselor it was very traditional certainly back in the 80s what did you do when you were midlife and you wanted to try and do some personal development you went and did a counseling course at adult education and that became quite a popular thing probably still is to a degree Largely, though, these have been superseded by all the alternative therapeutic type courses people can train in. People are seeking to avoid the pain of work, and yet they expect to have the same level rewards that the world of work, had they have done the, you know, the five-year study and so forth, would have brought them. So essentially, I can work smarter, not harder, and have the same level reward that anyone else would get. And that is the ethos that is sold generally the attitude is if you if it feels like hard work you're doing it wrong if it feels like hard work you're doing it wrong because success should be easy success should be effortless hell there's even a book out there entitled effortless success this whole idea that basically people can just get paid for talking after just learning how to talk to people in a particular way according to a particular model in a weekend course and then they will have six figure clients knocking at their door is just insane really is insane yet so many people promote this now all the people i know who are successful and i've got to be honest percentage wise of all the people i know in the therapeutic world who are actually making a living they are a tiny percentage i think the majority of people who are out there peddling their wares putting up their status updates on their facebook pages and their youtube channels and so forth i suspect the majority of those people are lying when they're telling you how much clients how many clients they've got there's somebody who's been in the national papers recently who i had a look because of the courses they were promoting and let's just say what the newspaper article said of this person and their six-figure income and what the accounts show they don't quite align with each other 
yet again. And uh, I've got to be honest, they rarely do. I have checked so many. In the UK, you can check people's accounts. Go to company's house or the, the online service company check. You can pull off people's public accounts if they're an incorporated limited company. And I've done that with quite a few people over the years. And very, very rarely does their, does their income reflect their claims of success. I know one person who is a quite a big name in the UK in the NLP world who runs business courses. And he's a, a success coach, business coach. Well, I've got his accounts from two years ago where he um, filed bankruptcy with £250,000 debt. Not for the first time, and I suspect it won't be the last time, yet he will teach you business success. Smoke and mirrors absolutely everywhere. So if you want to essentially get clients, if you want to be a professional, if you want to set up a career path for yourself, being a coach, practitioner, therapist, whatever, you're going to have to work hard. And I think, sorry, but this is bad news, the amount of work you're going to have to do far exceeds... Um, what you probably expect. As I was saying, all the people I know who are successful, and there's not very many of them, but all the people, by success, by the way, you can see, you see where I live, all right? I live in a tiny house. This is this house is tiny. I'm not six figure income. I'm not some, I've got a, one of the cheapest cars you could buy in the UK. Let's be, let's be honest. I earn a living. I make a living from the work that I do. I'm far from wealthy. And I don't think I'm likely ever to be in this line of work. If I went back to my day job, I would earn a lot more money, but it's not how I want to spend my days. That's, that's the reality of it. All the people I know who are successful, the amount of hours they put in, the amount of work they put in is astronomical. And the work ethic of all of the people I know who are successful is very, very strong indeed. Now, I compare that to the work ethic of the average person who contacts me. The average person who contacts me will essentially be very keen to express interest, be very keen to get involved, and then when given an opportunity, they don't do anything at all. I've lost counts now when I've put online a collaborative project or I've asked people to, you know, who, would anyone like to be involved in helping me with this particular thing? I get dozens of people immediately say, yes, I'm interested, I'd love to do that. I can be sure how many people will actually make a contribution and actually do something, pretty much zero. But gotta be realistic. I put a project out recently under the IMT thing. Lots of people, lots of people contact me telling me how much they want to be interested, how much they're interested and want to be involved. And we're now a month on and yeah, so, You've got to improve both reliability. You've got to be a, be a person of your word. That's quite important. But you've also got to improve your work ethic. Now, the problem about improving work ethic is you're going to have to spend a lot of time doing stuff you don't like doing. The admin, the accounting, the advertising, the talking to people you don't really want to talk to, making the awkward phone calls, the hours writing stuff and testing stuff out. It's, it's, it's absurd, the amount of work it takes. I mean, I, you've probably seen I have run, I run multiple websites. That takes up an awful lot of time. I want to be a coach and therapist. I don't want to be a webmaster. Yet, the majority of my time is spent on the computer being a webmaster for websites and sorting out people's login issues, password issues, that kind of stuff. And that takes up an extraordinary amount of time. Um, and in fact, that is probably at the moment my mainstay thing that I do doesn't earn me money, of course. That's just the maintenance of things that are earning the money. This is the thing I think people have to understand. The what is required in terms of the effort that people need to make. This whole notion that you can just work six hours a week and have a six figure income by being a life coach is the most absurd thing ever. And of course, they will tell you that for the simple reason that you are the customer. Here is one of the things that I, I realized about, say, the whole coaching world generally. It's the classic coaching coaches to coach coaches to coach more coaches. All of these coaching groups who are selling courses, teaching you how to be a coach, they're probably doing that because they didn't have any clients. And the chances are a lot of their trainees will end up running courses to teach coaches how to get coaches and, and, and so on. And it just this never ending pyramid. 
I'm reminded of the things I've seen in parts of India, particularly around the tourist areas. I'm thinking in terms of Goa. On the back streets or back, back roads of Goa, around the back of the beaches, you find lots and lots and lots of little windy roads with lots of people all selling the classic tourist crap, tie-dye and spiritual t-shirts and all the beads and all the stuff that in India they typically sell to the tourists. And there are thousands of sellers on every lining every street around around the back backwaters or areas of Goa. They're all selling the same stuff. Now, how many of those people are making any money? Probably not very many. And every tourist walking past, of course, is being shouted at to be called into every shop that they walk past, and there's hundreds and hundreds of them. So people start to avoid walking down those areas. Those people who are setting up those stalls are usually very, very poor and are desperate to make money. They've missed a trick though. They're not making any money. They are the customer. The tourists who walk past them aren't really the customer. The wholesalers, the manufacturers, who do they sell the most stuff to? They don't sell it to an endline user. They sell it to idiots who think they're business people. And those, those poor idiots lining the roads think they're a business person. And they think they're going to, they've got all this stock now. They've, they've probably borrowed a fortune paying quite high interest rates in order to buy in the stock that they can then resell at a markup price. And they can't, and they're not going to. And meanwhile, there's hundreds and hundreds of people all selling the same thing. Those hundreds and hundreds of people, they are the customer. They're the end line customer. It's just that they don't realize it. Now in the coaching world, this is the thing about most practitioners, therapists, and all the rest of it. The practitioner, the coach, they are the customer. Those clients, those mythical clients with the six figures lining up, they're not there. They're simply not there. So you end up having coaches, coaching coaches to coach coaches in this never ending pyramid. So in order to actually not be one of those people, you've got to drop this whole notion of an alternative career where you get paid lots of money for doing very little work. It, does, it simply doesn't operate like that. You need to have multiple income streams, multiple ways of presenting the work that you do, multiple fronts of marketing. So not just like the posters I've talked about or a website, there's multiple other things you need to do as well. You need to have quite a lot of diversity in terms of how you present yourself to the marketplace. So for example, the endless free talks. My goodness, the amount of free talks I have traveled all over parts of the world, all over the world really, um, giving free talks. I traveled all over the UK to every practice group around. I've gone literally for, I went to India for just a few days to go and meet one person just to make connection with that particular individual because I knew that that would help me further down the line and it always has done. There's a lot of cost up, up front with that sort of stuff. There's a lot of time invested in that kind of stuff too. And of course, none of it's guaranteed because it's a fool, it's a foolish thing to think, okay, I'm going to go meet with these people and make them my customers. Yeah, good luck with that. You won't get invited back. You have to build long-term business relationships with people. You have to build a long-term reputation. Too many people trying to cash in too quickly to basically, hey, look at me, I'm amazing. I've got a new, I've, I've got a certificate and, and I can change your life even though I'm 24 years old and haven't got much of a life myself and I'm a life coach. Um, you get that kind of thing it doesn't really build anything long term the old thing it takes 10 years to be an overnight success is probably not quite true it might take more like 15. i've been i started this in 1994 and it's really only the last 15 years that i've actually been able to be completely self-employed and have got enough money to live on. Uh, prior to that, I was requiring to do other other jobs as well and do other things for, for income. It takes a long time. Now, some people get lucky. Um, a lot of the people that you will see claiming to be that lucky person who have been is an overnight success and all the rest of it, get a copy of their accounts, go to company's house and just request them. Have a look at the reality of it. You might want to do that with some of your favorite alphabet therapists and trainers who are claiming to be super rich and wealthy. Um, just check the reality against the claims. One last thing. If you say you're going to do something, you've got to do it. If you're going to be there, turn up on time. These things aren't complicated. Yet now I, I teach courses and I can see by how people behave towards the room and other people in the room, how they treat people. The person who's late every morning, they're late in after every break. That kind of person, 
they, they often they're expecting everyone to wait for them as well i can see how they're expecting how they're treating me but more importantly how they're treating their other participants in the room everyone's paying to be there people want to they're there for a reason the people who say they'll do something and then don't do it and i see that every day every single day i'm dealing with people who tell me they'll do stuff they assure me their level of interest and i know i just know they're never going to follow through on it. They just simply won't because that's what, unfortunately, the people who come into coaching and therapy tend to be like. I'd love to be able to say that, okay, maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe it's just my poor sample size. But this has been a consistent experience of mine for, for several decades now. Also, it is the experience of several decades too. Um, it is the experience of colleagues of mine as well who report exactly the same phenomena. A conversation I had with somebody yesterday, I found myself saying, I think therapists are basically fundamentally useless at life. And that's why they become therapists. Now, that might be unfair generalization. And do please put any comments in the comment section to support or to the contradict, however you feel. Um, but the reality is, people are pretty poor and that's poor at life and poor at business because their work ethic is poor and their reliability is even worse those are the two things i would urge you to really really pay attention to and be prepared to work a lot harder than you currently are <laughs>